Okay, okay, everyone. Welcome uh, again. This is Franklin. I'm one of the two co-founders of NorCal SCI. Welcome to tonight's session of uh, Chef in a Wheelchair. Uh, our good friend Arash Bayat Maku is going to be talking about how to prepare meals that are sort of uh, have your fair share of protein, and he'll talk about the importance of that uh, that stuff and how to uh, manage cooking uh, while keeping a healthy amount of protein in your diet. So. Um, this is part of NorCal CI's virtual is the new reality series that we are hosting. And a couple of housekeeping items that I just wanna get out of the way. Uh, number one, you are all muted and that way we could uh, keep any sort of distraction to a minimum from background noise. Um, now the question uh, is, how do you ask questions if you're muted? Uh, easy answer is that there's a chat feature on your screen that you could use to post your questions. Um, the presentation is going to be about 45 minutes or so long and uh, Arash is going to be uh, welcoming and answering any questions that you may have towards the tail end. So we'll have about 10-15 minutes of time to do that. Um, and then um, also if you don't know how to use a chat or you're struggling with it, feel free to uh, use uh, email. Uh, I'll be checking my email the, the entire time. So you can send questions via email to info at norcalsci.org. The second thing is that as usual, we're recording all of these presentations. And that means that if you have registered for these uh, events, such as tonight, uh, uh, we'll make the recording available to you on Monday of next week. So if at any time you need to jump off the, the call or are not able to tune in, uh, no worries, you'll have full access to the entire presentation. Uh, so that's about it. So let's get started by introducing Arash. Uh, Arash uh, experienced a C5, C6 incomplete injury in 2012 as a result of a fall. Uh, he has given numerous talks and shared his story, story of perseverance, recovery, and challenging limits to audiences large and small, including a TEDx talk. He's a Bay Area native uh, and lives currently in Walnut Creek. He just moved in uh, to a new house there. Congratulations again, Arash. Um, he credits his California upbringing uh, to, for his love of the outdoors, nature, and guess what, cooking. Uh, activities that he still cherishes as he continues to travel, explore, and enjoy new experiences. Uh, he is married with a daughter um, and also serves as a board member on our board of directors here at NorCal CI. And I consider him, a, consider him an exceptional friend. So, Arash, uh, welcome again. Thank you for letting us into your new home and take it away, please. Thank you, Franklin. That welcome was uh, far too generous. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, Frank? you're yeah. all good. Okay. Great. Well, let's get started. A um, lot to cover, um, and I am I am so excited for today's topic. Uh, I'm I'm just beyond excited to to get into it with all of you. Um, I just so everyone knows, this is um, as as you might know, my sessions of cooking are definitely working in conjunction with um, with the the food nutrition presentations that Shelly has been presenting. So she did her first part. I did my first part last time, kind of general overview. Last time she did her presentation on protein. So if you missed that presentation on the nutrition and, and the kind of science and nutrition and diet about protein, please uh, watch that presentation whenever you can. It's an extremely informative. And I'm here to kind of follow up on that and show the practical side. So um, quick recap of a couple things. I hope you joined us last time, um, but I'm going to just uh, real quick mention a couple things I mentioned last time as well, but we're going to get a lot more into the actual food today. So uh, things I wanted to mention, I talked about last time a lot. I'm just going to quickly say knife is sharp. Remember, I talked about how important it is to have a sharp, good knife, whatever it is you're using. Uh, I've got my apron on. I talked a little bit about protecting my lap with the apron and how important that is. So apron is on, knife is sharp. And as always, I've got my cutting board on my lap and this is the cutting board I use. Thin, light, has a hole so I can grab it easily. And it's on my lap at all times. That's how I cook all the time. Um, my four principles of cooking that I talked about in the last presentation, I'll mention them quickly, quickly now. Number one is tasty. It's got to taste good. If it doesn't taste good, we're not going to eat it. 
Number two, it's fun. I think cooking is really fun. I want to make it fun for all of you. Number three is efficient. Um, I don't like wasting time. I don't have a lot of time to waste. I have uh, a two, almost two-year-old daughter and another one on the way, and it's, uh, there, there's just too much to do. So um, efficient is the third, and fourth is economical. I've been a frugal cook my whole life. I'm proud of it. I don't use expensive ingredients. I don't use uh, fancy things. I like to make it as, a, as a, a accessible and affordable and, a, and, and uh, you know, to all of you. So those are my principles. Um, please, at, you know, after this presentation, give us feedback. If you want to see next time, we're gonna have more of these sessions. So um, I'm happy to adapt it to your needs. If you wanna see me do more of the cooking and the chopping, kind of that kind of thing, I'm happy to do more of that. If you want to have it be more general, whatever it is, just uh, feel free to give us feedback because it is helpful for me. I'm designing these sessions by what I think is the most useful. But um, if you have specific thoughts on like, hey, I really want to see you how you actually do X, Y, and Z. Uh, if you joined me last time, you know, I cook pretty much anything and everything. I eat everything um, in terms of I, there are a fair few things I don't like, but, um, but I do eat mostly, I'd say 90% plant-based these days. So that's where a lot of my focus on cooking is. But don't worry if you're not plant-based, stay along for the ride. It's going to be fun. So. Um, Protein, the buzzword of all buzzwords in the cooking world. It seems like everywhere you look, um, you see protein. It's on like crackers and, you know, bread. Everything's supposed to have protein in it right now. Um, as I said, Shelly covered a lot of this in her presentation. Um, but uh, there is a little bit, I will say, too much of an obsession with protein. And I'm going to throw out uh, a couple quick statistics for you. One is that most Americans, and this is like, I think over 90%, get twice as much protein in their daily diet as they need. Let me repeat that, twice as much as they actually need. So most people are eating way more protein than they actually need. This is a thing that has been going for a few years now that everyone thinks that the more protein, the better, and there's just no way to get enough of it. So, um, so yeah, we want to dispel some of that. Let's focus on pro obviously protein, and that's what this session is about. But let's focus on a lot of other nutrients that are in um, the foods that you want to be eating in order to maintain a healthy diet, especially as a person with a spinal cord injury. Uh, the big focus is, this is the second statistic I want to throw out, is 95-7% of Americans don't eat enough fiber. Um, and fiber is so important. And if you have a spinal cord injury, you probably already know the importance of fiber, excuse me, because you know about the challenges with the bowel program and digestion. And uh, I can't tell you, that's one of the main reasons I, I eat the way I do. I eat mostly plant-based is because uh, my digestion and, and intake of fiber is just so much better. So um, my suggestion is don't obsess too much with getting just an insane amount of protein. Um, get it, eat it, but eat a healthy, balanced diet. And if it's plant-based, you'll get more than enough protein. Um, and if it's not, then you still probably will too. And remember that I'm going to talk a lot about other sources of protein. Remember that animal protein uh, often doesn't have any fiber. Uh, and there are other nutritional elements of animal protein, but in terms of fiber, in terms of vitamins, there's often very little um, to that. So that's a perfect segue for me to start talking about a few items that are high protein items that I like to use that I'm going to suggest to you now. And I'm going to just gonna run through them quickly and then get cooking. So the first thing I want to mention is chia seeds. Um, I'm going to hold it up. So chia seeds are a superfood. They're a trendy item. You've probably, uh, maybe you've heard about it. If you haven't, then you probably will soon. Um, these things are insane. Um, they are packed with so many nutrients, tons of protein. And most importantly, if you look at the nutritional elements of it, one tablespoon of chia seeds, which is just a little spoonful, has 20% of your daily fiber. So that is a ton of fiber. Uh, in addition to having three grams of protein. Uh, and usually when you're eating it, you're gonna eat a lot more than one tablespoon worth. So this is a, a great choice for healthy, great protein. There's lots to do with this. Um, 
I get it at Costco. It's very inexpensive for organic um, chia seed from Costco. I highly recommend that. Uh, again, I'm just going to mention these things briefly. We can always come back to talk more about them at the end if we want. So that's the first thing. Second thing, another Costco favorite, um, hemp seeds. They call them hemp hearts here. These are shell hemp seeds. Hemp seeds are, as it says right on the front, 10 grams of protein per serving. Um, these are great because in my opinion, they don't have a lot of taste. Um, and so it's just a super easy way to add protein into your diet without really messing with the flavor. You can sprinkle it on a salad. I put it into smoothies. If you eat cereal or oatmeal in the morning, you can throw some into your cereal or oatmeal. Um, if you, if you're just eating something that already has like a lot of flavor in it, you're eating like, you know, some kind of food and you're just trying to add that little bit of extra punch of nutritional value. Hemp seeds are awesome. Um, and again, in addition to protein, they have all kinds of other uh, great nutrients. Uh, they do have 10 grams of protein per serving, which is a ton. So healthy plant-based source of protein. Um, and if you get it from Costco, uh, it's a great value, huge bag like this. Um, is not very expensive at all. So very easy way to up your healthy protein intake. Um, next thing I'm going to mention is uh, lentils. Uh, I'm going to talk about a lot about some other stuff, but uh, I'm showing this. I might have talked about it in the last session, but Trader Joe's and I think other places sell these too. These are uh, vacuum packed lentils. They come in the package. Where's my camera? There it is. So these are awesome because uh, again, they're inexpensive. It's a pound of cooked lentils um, and they're ready to eat. You just take them out of the package. What can you do with this? You can take it out of the package, put it in a bowl and make a salad out of it. You could sprinkle it onto a salad you've already made. If you want to make like a, like a nice healthy salad for lunchtime and you want to give it a little more umph uh, and, and nutrition, you can put this in there. Um, these are great. You can blend it up and put it into burgers. I make falafel out of these. Um, these are just so, so versatile. And I like this format of them. I use a ton of dried beans and lentils and all that as well, but it's nice to have these on hand uh, for convenience. Uh, and as I said, I like to be efficient. I like to be um, in my cooking. So this is a very efficient way to cook and get and if you don't know already, lentils are insanely good for you, insanely packed with protein. And again, the big difference is if you're eating things like beans and lentils, you're getting a ton of protein, but then you're also getting out off the charts amounts of fiber and other nutritional magnesium, potassium, other nutritional benefits that you don't get if you're eating a big steak or a burger. So again, to each their own, but I just wanna make sure that's super clear. Uh, and then the last thing I wanna mention um, is this is an item I only got to know more recently. This is called nutritional yeast. It comes uh, in a bag like this, or you can buy it in the bulk section. Uh, this is really, really great. It's gluten-free. Um, it's obviously animal-free. Um, this stuff is like um, people who eat plant-based strictly use it in place of cheese instead of like Parmesan cheese or something. So it's got a cheesy flavor, an umami flavor. You can put it in pasta. You can sprinkle it. We sprinkle it on salad. Um, my daughter loves this. She loves pasta with this stuff now. Uh, but it's also, I just recently learned, packed with protein. Um, so just a few tablespoons of this has eight grams of protein, which is a ton in addition to other good stuff. So I really like nutritional yeast. We can come back to that, talk more about it later. But that is um, about... It on that. Oh, the other one I wanted to mention, well, I don't have it here, but is, uh, is oats. Oats are another great source of plant protein and there's so much you can do with them. I think in a later show, we'll do a whole thing on overnight oats and how to make that because I've only recently rediscovered that too. And it's like the easiest way in the world to make a healthy, delicious breakfast. So let's get to, I'm going to make three things with you all today. I've got everything prepped and ready. I'm going to move somewhat quickly, but I think we can make it happen. So we're gonna go to item number one. So remember, these are, these are protein packed dishes. I'm gonna give you the general, don't obsess too much about like, what, how much of that did he put in or how much of you know, whatever ingredient. I wanna show you the general idea and then you can always customize it and make it how you want. And honestly, the internet is just, you know, you can search for the thing I'm gonna make and there's a bazillion recipes of everything. 
I, of course, like my own uh, ideas as well, but um, I want to keep it kind of, you know, I don't want you to worry too much about like the specific ingredients, uh, how much I'm putting in. It's more just the idea. So let's get cooking. If we can flip the camera around and all right. So good. All right. First thing we're going to make is a white bean salad. Um, I'm using canned beans. These are just uh, canned beans. Again, inexpensive. They're like a dollar a can. I use two cans worth. I love this salad because it's so versatile uh, and quick and it makes for a great lunch. Once it's done, you can put it on bread or on toast and eat it like that. You can um, eat it on, on its own. You can eat it as a side dish for something else that you're making. I love that stuff. So. Uh, with any canned bean, it's important to remove it from the can and drain it. So all I've done is taken the beans out, uh, drain it, and sorry, and rinse it with water. You want to get that kind of goopy stuff off of it. Uh, it just tastes better like that. So don't dump it straight from the can. Give it a rinse of water. I did that in the past already. So um, I'm going to dump the beans into this bowl for my salad and then come over here I'm going to show you a couple of things so these are the things I'm going to go into into the salad I'm going to chop these up for you to show um, red onion uh, I love red onion uh, you don't have to put as much as I'm going to put in but uh, I love it I'm not going to put all of this in but I am going to show you how to chop it up these are just some chives I had in the garden uh, I'm going to throw these in and then sage as well from the garden you don't need to use these herbs, but sage and white beans are a very classic combination, especially in Italian cooking, where this kind of recipe is drawing inspiration from. So it goes really well um, with this. But again, you could use any herb you want. You could, you could put cilantro, you could put parsley. These are just what I had on hand. Uh, and then the last thing you're wondering, why am I showing a tomato, cherry tomato? Uh, I'm showing these for a couple reasons. One, it's kind of the tail end of tomato season. Uh, I do like to cook seasonally. So I'm mentioning that um, it's a great time to make that use of the last tomatoes of the season. But also I want to show, um, because cutting tomatoes can be tricky. So I want to show one of my tricks for, for that real quick. So um, tomatoes have a tough skin to chop. So what I use, I talked about this last time, is just a little serrated knife. Um, this is like a $5 knife I bought, it's nothing fancy. You can use a bread knife, any kind of serrated knife. And I use this to chop tomatoes because even the sharpest chef knife, um, you'll cut them, but it'll dull your knife really quickly. So I really recommend if you're cutting up tomatoes uh, for these last few weeks of tomato season, find a serrated knife and use that. So uh, I'm just gonna chop these up few of these here so you see all I do with this bigger one is I quarter it um, for these smaller ones I just cut in half you know whatever looks good it's just up to you I'm not super strict on you know uniformity I'm not a pro chef I'm not serving it at a fancy restaurant it's just what looks good if you like them smaller make them smaller um, but this is how I cut tomatoes and then I'm going to put them right into the bowl. I cut some previously, so I'm gonna throw those into the bowl. And then um, I wanna show you, I did this last time, but I was a little rushed. So I'm gonna do it again because onions are in everything. I do like onions. I'm using red onion here. I'm gonna show you real quick how I finely dice an onion. So for a salad like this, even though I really love onion, I do want small pieces. So how do you do that? Um, this is the way to chop an onion and again it's very helpful and important to use a sharp knife. So the smaller pieces you want the more lines you're gonna make on the onion. So what do, what do I mean by that? So I'm gonna cut not all the way through. You see I'm leaving a little bit of space at the end because I want this to stay together. So I'm cutting All these lines here, this is probably more than enough, so I'm going to cut that piece off. And so I've got these lines all the way here, and I'm going to go across. Now, this is a little tricky. If you're not super experienced with knives, be careful. Um, I'm confident with that, so I'm doing it. But 
now we've got all these little pieces of onion we're gonna get. So if you want bigger chunks, you do less of these lines. Um, that's totally fine. But I want really small chunks of onion. And now I'm just going to chop. I've got a nice sharp knife, so it's really easy to get through it. And as I get towards the end, I just kind of flip it down on its side, finish it off like this. And I've got some nice chopped onion. I might go a few more times over it to get it a little finer. Again, this is just a personal preference, but it's probably more onion than a lot of people like. I like a lot of onion, so I just kind of scoop, put it into my bowl. Actually, sometimes what I do is I lift the whole cutting board up, bring it over, and then scrape it in. So onions, beans are in. Now I've got sage. So back here on the cutting board, sage, there's, I just kind of try to stack the leaves up, chop it up, fine. Sage and white beans are, like I said, a match made in heaven. It is so, so good. You make this salad and you serve it to anyone and they will love it. It is um, such a great combo. They eat this kind of thing all over Italy. Um, so there's my chopped up sage, done. Uh, lastly, chives. Again, these are just nice. They don't have a super strong flavor. You can put whatever you want. You don't have chives, no problem. Um, if you wanted to put a different vegetable, you could put carrots, you could put celery, you could put broccoli, you could, uh, if you eat uh, tuna, it's a really great salad to add some like canned tuna or something. Um, this is a very easy, again, I'm giving you the blueprint uh, and allowing you to do whatever you want with it. So now I'm going to bring my bowl here and actually grab a spoon. So all my components are in here. I've got olive oil. I'm going to dress it with olive oil. Olive oil is super good for you. It does need a little bit because the beans soak up quite a bit. So there's my olive oil. Now I've got my little salt and pepper here. I'm gonna, I just eyeball this. Um, you know, again, I don't cook with a lot of exact measurements. Uh, that's just me, but um, season it how you like. Salt and pepper and olive oil. Um, I meant to get a lot of fresh lemons. I did not, so I'm actually just using some pre-squeezed lemon juice, nothing wrong with this. So I'm just gonna pop this open and, tricky for my hands, and just sprinkle it on. Beans soak up olive oil, they soak up lemon. So you kind of need a lot of liquid. Um, you don't want this to get soggy and goopy, but you do want a lot of these, uh, of lemon juice to give it that nice brightness. So that's basically it. That's the components to my salad. I'm gonna toss this scoop it, mix it, twirl it, whirl it, whatever you want to say. And you see how beautiful that is. And you can, again, add whatever you want. If you want to add green onions, if you want to add um, something else, poached uh, hard boiled egg, something like that, you can easily add to this. And this is an easy protein packed, so good. And you see it's not, swimming and dressing so it's not going to get soggy and gross and you can keep that in the fridge and eat it for um, a couple days so i'm going to move this over go on to my next thing um hummus um, hummus is uh, we all know what it is now it's become so popular but i'm going to tell you something um homemade hummus it, it doesn't even compare to store-bought hummus i don't buy store-bought hummus um, not because I'm a snob or anything. I just don't think it tastes that great. And so um, if I don't make hummus at home, I generally don't eat it. Um, but making your own hummus is so, so easy. So I want to make sure that we can, you know, talk about that. Um, so what I'm, again, this is just a blank slate. This is how I'm making it. I'm showing you the basics. So for hummus, usually it's made with, <clears throat> excuse me, chickpeas. Um, and you can use canned chickpeas. <laughs> in this case, I use dried chickpeas. 
that I soaked overnight. Um, we can come back to why we soak beans. I do want to talk about that later, but uh, you do want to soak them overnight if you can. Uh, if you can't, that's okay. You just cook them for a longer period of time in water. <clears throat> so all I did was take a cup of dried chickpeas, which is so inexpensive, so economical, soaked them in water last night. And then today I cooked them in a little bit of boiling water, just enough water to cover it. And then if you come over to the food processor, that's what I have in here. It's just some, some plain cooked chickpeas, no seasoning, no salt, nothing. If you were using canned chickpeas, you could do that. Um, same thing as I said earlier, you'd want to rinse them, get that goopy stuff off them, then throw them into your food processor or blender. So um, for me, there's a few essential elements of chickpeas. Um, one of which is tahini. This is, you, you kind of can't skip this. This is what makes it really great. And the good news is for protein, this is double protein. Chickpeas obviously are just swimming packed with protein. Um, tahini is made with sesame seeds and it's also a huge, I mean, I'm looking at it, seven grams of protein for a serving. A serving is like a, a spoonful of this. So this is double protein uh, in here. And uh, tahini is, uh, it's, it's awesome. It's easy to find. Um, and these days it's just, it's all over the place. You can see it's kind of separates the oil and the, the solid. Uh, it does have a lot of fat, so you want to be careful about that and mindful of that. Um, so, but it gives it that that really unique flavor, and all hummus, uh, traditional hummus, has this. So, I'm going to bring this up here, and I'm going to spoon some tahini into. Actually, you know what? This is too hard for me. So, I'm going to grab this jar carefully because my hands are not super strong. And I'm going to just dump some tahini in here, about half a cup or so. Uh, so that's my tahini into the hummus, into the food processor. We're going to adjust this later, so don't worry. Uh, garlic. Hummus has to have garlic. I love garlic. I put a lot in. This is like six cloves. So if you want to come over here, I'm going to show you. So we've got some whole garlic cloves here that I just peeled. This is cilantro. I'm just adding it in. It's not a must, but hummus is so customizable. So I had some in the fridge. I wanted to throw it in. I like making it kind of green. So here's some cilantro. This is cumin. Cumin is probably my single favorite, most used spice. I uh, highly recommend you get your hands on some. And then I've got just a little bit of uh, mild chili powder here. So just to give it a little bit of spice. So um, these are gonna go in. I don't need to chop them. I'm just gonna grab this garlic throw it in here. The food processor is going to do the work. My cilantro, it looks like a lot, but I'll probably use most of it right into the food processor. And then I don't usually do this on plates. I did this for the visual for you guys. Um, so now I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to get it out of here. So I am going to just dump my spices in. And then also important, as I said, um, essential element, you need acid. You have to have acid in hummus. If you don't, it'll just be too thick and creamy. And um, there's nothing wrong with thick and creamy, but it, it just doesn't taste right. It's not balanced. So again, I'm gonna use that same lemon juice I had. If you have fresh lemons, even better. So you need quite a bit of this. Uh, usually I add like the juice of like five lemons, four lemons, it depends. Um, but for a cup of dried chickpeas like I'm using, um, you do need quite a bit of lemon juice um, and the acid just wakes everything up in your mouth um, when you eat it. And that's a sign of a, of a good hummus. So I added a few squeezes of lemon juice. Um, we need some salt, obviously. We want to have it, let it have some flavor. So I've got my salt thing. I just use my fingers. This is my main salt thing. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to add a little bit of pepper as well, just a little black pepper. And then we added the tahini in there. And as I said, the tahini has a lot of fat. Um, so I don't want to add a ton of olive oil and make it too just like rich and heavy. And it can, hummus can get a little heavy um, if you don't make it right. Or honestly, that's why I don't really like the store, store bought kind. It's just like I eat a few scoops of it or something. And then I just feel it kind of just sits in my stomach. So the way I make it, it's a lot lighter. So I'm going to add just a little bit of olive oil. 
maybe like a tablespoon or two, just to give it a little bit of flavor. And then uh, I'm gonna, last ingredient I'm gonna add to this is just a little bit of cold water. And this is just to thin it out. Tahini is thick, chickpeas are thick and kind of um, creamy. So I wanna just make sure it's the right texture. I'm gonna add a, just a splash of water. I'm gonna blend it and then see what it looks like and then adjust. So I'm gonna add just like a splash, quarter cup of water, something like that, probably a little more. Again, I'm just using my instincts, but um, um, that's it. So I'm gonna put this on, I'm gonna blend it up, and I'll be right back. Okay, so that's good enough for now, just for me to get a taste. Where did my spoon go? So now I'm just gonna dip right in. It's okay if it's not totally blended yet. I'm just tasting it first for, for, for the taste. And, okay, so it's a little chunky. Um, it's definitely not right. It needs more so I can taste it and I highly recommend anytime you're cooking taste your food I'm surprised at how many people cook and they don't taste it um, I can tell it definitely needs more water it probably needs a little bit more olive oil um, and a little bit more lemon juice so I'm gonna do that right now I'm gonna add it's too thick tasting so I want that nice creamy texture so just some cold water nothing complicated I'm gonna add another pinch of salt and it definitely needs that acid. It's tasting a little too, um, it just doesn't taste right right now. So I'm adding more lemon juice. Um, if you don't have lemon juice, you can use red wine vinegar. You can use white wine vinegar. Um, again, I'm just showing you the basics. Don't worry too much about, uh, and as I said, there's a million recipes out there. So um, you can customize hummus. You can make it with white beans, like the ones I just had. You can make it with beet. There's like beet hummus. Um, you could make it, you could add whatever you want to it. You could add roasted red pepper. Think of when you're at the store and you see all the different flavors of hummus. You can make that at home. Just get a jar of red peppers, roasted red peppers, throw a couple of those into the blender and you've got roasted red pepper hummus. You could add more garlic, less garlic, um, whatever herbs you like. You could add mint. It's just endless and make it how you like it. And I promise you, if you make your own hummus, you will never go back. It's so, so much better. It's lighter and fluffier. So I'm gonna blend it again. It looks better already. Okay, got a nice. I could just tell when it was spinning around in there that it's better, and I can tell now as I'm mixing it, the texture is a lot better. So I'm going to take another taste. Mm. That's dang good. I'm going to add a tiny bit more salt. And then I'm gonna just, well, I can blend it up later, but to me, it tastes pretty darn good. It's pretty spot on. Uh, I don't need to, I, I would blend it longer so it gets thinner and creamier and, and more consistent, but I don't wanna waste time doing that with you right now. So this is pretty much done. Uh, when we're all done, I'm gonna blend this for another 30 seconds, one minute. And then um, you've got, you saw what, I don't know if you can come in here and see, but one cup of dried chickpeas and i will tell you dried chickpeas cost like nothing they cost i don't know what one cup of dried chickpeas cost probably like 30 cents 50 cents look at how much hummus i just made i mean that's like two or three of the containers you buy at the store it's so much better you throw it in the fridge you can put it on sandwiches obviously you can dip it you can, um, you can do whatever you want with it and we all know how much um, how popular hummus is so um good i'm doing good on time so um, again, if you have questions, we can come back to them later, but I'm going to move on to my third and final thing I want to prepare with you today. Um, so let's go over to this side of the kitchen. Um, I am going to make chili. Um, when I thought of like protein, uh, pro a session on protein, I was like, I have to make chili. A, it is so, so full of protein. There's nothing <clears throat> better than like a big hearty bowl of chili. B, I think most people like chili. This is something that um, if you're making it for other people, other members in your family, if you're entertaining, um, everybody, I feel like, likes chili. I'm going to grab a little water. 
So um, I just think chili is one of my favorite things to make. And when it comes to making a really protein rich meal, um, it's fantastic. So um, again, I'm just showing you basics. You can go whatever direction you want, but uh, I prepped a lot of this ahead of time. I didn't want to waste time um, prepping this. So I'm showing you what I did. Uh, and, and if you're not plant-based and you want to do meat in your chili, that's fine. Just add it in. I'm using my good friend, the crock pot slow cooker. You don't have to use this um, at all. You can just do it in a big pot on the stove. Um, but you just have to keep an eye on it. It'll take a, you know, a couple hours to get it right. Um, but I like the crock pot because I can put everything in here, turn it on and literally leave for 12 hours. Like I'm going to make this now and it'll be ready tomorrow morning and then we'll probably eat it tomorrow night. So, um, you don't have to have a crock pot, but if you do, this is a really easy way to do it. And for someone who has like less ability in the kitchen, you're just opening and prepping and dumping stuff in. There's no cooking, there's no sizzling or hot stove. This is a great, easy thing to make. So for my chili, uh, I soaked two cups of beans. I did a mixture of beans that I had. I keep a lot of different beans in the cupboard in the pantry, but uh, I did kidney beans, black beans, and adzuki beans. All beans are completely packed with protein. I'll let you look up the figures if you want. Um, and they are packed with fiber. So again, for us people with SCIs, this is such a great way to get your protein and get your fiber. So I have a few other items here that I prepped ahead of time. I want to show you those first. Um, some carrots, celery, a couple, a couple of each, a couple stalks of celery, a couple carrots. I had a little bit of kale in the fridge that was going bad uh, soon, so I wanted to use it up. Again, you don't have to do it. It's just an easy way to add extra nutrition to your chili, and it's going to cook for so long that I'm not going to even really taste it or know. So if someone, if you have a kid or someone in the family who maybe doesn't like a vegetable or doesn't like leafy greens, hide it into a big thing of chili and they probably won't even know. Um, and then I've got an onion and a half yellow onion that I chopped up. That's what's here. Um, and then I've got two cans of diced tomatoes. I like the no salt added because I like to salt my own food. So all of this is going to go into my crock pot. This is hard with my hands, but I'm going to do it. All right. So I've got my onions in, I've got my vegetables in, and um, again, chili is just one of those things that's so comforting. I know it's hot out right now, but in the winter time, um, what's better than a bowl of chili? Uh, it's also great because you can garnish it with all kinds of fun stuff. You can put, you know, um, a little bit of like Greek yogurt or sour cream on top. Uh, if you want to go that route, um, you know, chopped up green onions, you know, there's so many things you can do with chili, uh, things to add. So. Uh, I'm going to add my beans. This is a heavier bowl. So again, I soaked these overnight. I haven't done anything else to them and I just soaked them in water. I'm going to throw them in with their water. Okay. And then I'm going to add my tomatoes, one can and two cans of tomatoes. And then a couple of last things. Um, I'm going to throw a little bit of tempeh in here. Tempeh is something that is, it's again, another like superfood and a great source of plant protein. I kept the package so I could show you what it looks like. But uh, again, this is inexpensive, super high quality. It's fermented soybean. Um, it sounds weird. It's not. It's just super, super uh, nutritious. It's again, 18 grams of protein per serving. It says it right there. Uh, if you don't eat meat like I don't, um, this is a great way to get like chunks of stuff in the chili. Um, we can talk about this in future episodes or episodes, future sessions too. I keep saying that. Um, but I'm going to add a little bit of tempeh into it and then we're pretty much almost done and I can do a little Q&A. So I forgot my knife. I'm going to grab my knife. So, um, and tempeh is very, very... Um, easy to work with. So I'm going to take it out of its package. I've got this big block of tempeh and I'm probably going to put like half of it in for now. Um, but you can crumble it with your hands and it kind of can get into like a ground meat texture. I use that a lot to make like uh, tacos or whatever. But in this case, I kind of want to emulate like chunks of like something, you know, that isn't beans. So I'm just going to cut it into strips. 
like this, and then turn it around. And again, it's just whatever size you like to eat. If you want bigger chunks, make bigger chunks. If you want smaller and you want to crumble it up, do that. So I'm going to grab this, dump it into my crock pot. And you may be wondering, well, where is it going to, how is it going to taste like chili? Um, and that's where this last um, plate comes in that I want to show you. So chili is, um, I put a lot of great flavor and spices in it. Again, there's a million different ways to do it. I think these are important to do. So I'm going to go around the plate and show you what I'm doing. Um, so I've got about five, six cloves of garlic. That's going to make a lot of chili. So I do want a lot of garlic. If you don't like it, obviously do less. I love garlic. It's super good for you. Why not? So, and again, it's going to turn into a chili. It's going to turn into like a big bowl of soups. So you're not even going to, you know, taste, uh, if, it, if it's done right, it's going to taste, you know, great. So I've got some chopped garlic bay leaves um, these add a great flavor and aroma you want to use these for uh, anytime you're making soup or beans this is cinnamon uh, cinnamon stick if you've only seen cinnamon in its powdered form uh, welcome cinnamon is actually a bark of a tree so they take a piece of bark off the tree and cut it and it curls up so I'm gonna throw this whole thing in there um, because it's gonna it's so much better than ground cinnamon it's got such a better flavor and then before we eat it you know I'm gonna fish it out uh, same with the bay leaves. They don't, they don't, you know, it's not going to hurt you, but you don't want to eat them. Uh, these are cloves. This is a really, really tasty spice. I love it in chili. I think it's great. Um, and then we're going to go around the bowl here. We've got cumin, coriander. This is a little bit of um, paprika. My wife doesn't like to eat super spicy, so I'm not putting chili powder in, or I'm putting a little bit of chili powder in, but uh, instead I'm using paprika, which is a sweet paprika to give it a nice flavor without the spice. Then we've got allspice. Um, allspice is one spice. It's got a weird name, but it's, it's weird. It's, it's, it's not a blend of spices. So that's allspice. And then we've got, um, what did I have here? Oh yeah, that's like a, another like kind of milder chili powder, black pepper, and last but not least, a little bit of nutmeg. And trust me, nutmeg goes really, really well in this. So these are my seasonings. I'm gonna put all this into my crock pot. Nothing complicated about that. Get it all in there. That is like flavor central. I'm gonna grab my salt and pepper and throw that in. So, oh no, I already added black pepper. See, I caught myself. So all I need is some salt. Uh, I'm not too worried about the seasoning of this because I just want this to cook. Um, and then once it's cooked, I'm going to taste it and maybe, you know, if it needs more salt or whatever, uh, add it later. But that's it. I'm going to cover this with water. I don't need to do that now, but you get the idea. I'm basically, if you take one last look at the crock pot here, everything's in here. You saw I didn't have to cook anything ahead of time. I just cut it up, prepped it, put it in this. I'm going to cover it with water, put the lid on. That's the beauty of a crock pot. You can leave your house um and have it keep cooking i'm going to turn it on and in about eight to ten hours whatever uh, i've got a giant thing of chili and this makes a lot of chili you might be thinking like i put a lot of these seasonings in that's because this is going to make so much chili i'm going to be able to freeze some of this for later i'm going to be able to give some away i'm going to we're obviously going to eat it for a couple of meals so this makes a ton of food um so Again, I said back to my principles, economical, um, efficient, tasty, and, and fun. And, and you'll, if you make this, you will not regret it. And you can add whatever else you want to it. Uh, I sometimes add a sweet potato. Uh, I would do that later in the process when it's more like cooked. Otherwise, your sweet potato is just turned into mush. Um, or another great thing right now, it's pumpkin season, squash season. If you like pumpkins, if you like butternut squash, that's another great thing you can add into your chili. Uh, again, anything you want. You want to make it smokier, add some like smoky spices. You want to make it, um, you know, thicker. You can, you know, add a little less liquid or whatever. Play with it, like have fun with it. There are so many ways to make your food taste good. And back to our protein, uh, you saw um, two, can, uh, two cups of dried beans, tons of protein and tempeh. So we got double, triple, quadruple protein in here. You cannot find me a, um, a healthier protein-packed meal than this. 
And the best part about this is, I don't know if you noticed, no oil, no fat. So this is about as healthy as it gets. I didn't add any oil. I don't need it. I don't need any kind of fat. So this is super, super healthy. Uh, chili, ready to go. White bean salad, homemade hummus. That's what we did today. I know I've been covering a lot, talking a lot. So I'm going to stop there and uh, allow for some questions um, from all of you. All right. And uh, once you get a drink of water, because you've been doing a lot of talking too. Thank well, you. Too much uh, time. No, no, no. Uh, we All have right. a few questions. So uh, sure. one question was, uh, how much protein do you try to, to uh, what is your intake of protein on an average day? Um, I don't count my protein. Um, I, well, how would I you just... know if you've uh, over, you ate too, you took, took in too much or took in too little over the course um, of the day? It's, uh, I'm going to defer to Shelly on that uh, in terms of the amounts. Uh, okay. As I said, I try to eat a healthy, balanced diet. I know that I'm getting enough protein because everything that I showed you, that's how I cook in general. And these dishes all have tons of protein. Um, so I don't ever worry about getting enough protein. Uh, again, there's just too much of an obsession in our society with, with protein. And remember that we're all getting generally twice as much as we actually need. You don't need all this protein. And if you're eating a lot of animal protein, it is messing with, again, with as a person with a spinal cord injury, it's messing with your digestion, with your um, bowel movements and everything. It slows everything down. If you eat a lot of cheese, if you eat a lot of meat, um, trust me, if you cut some of that out and you up your intake of fiber, so you're getting enough protein, but also more importantly, what did I say? 95% of people aren't eating enough fiber. I think it could be 98%. You're going to feel better, eat better. So I don't count the amount of protein. I just eat a healthy, balanced diet. And uh, there's all kinds of tools online to calculate how much you need per your body weight. Or I think Shelly is really the great resource for, for yeah. that. So, um, well, And I'm going to supplement what you said. So uh, folks, uh, Shelly did a presentation last month uh, on protein. And in fact, uh, when we send out the email with the recording of tonight's presentation. I'll be sure to also include the, the link to that presentation because she did an incredible job of just describing, you know, what your protein intake should be. So thanks, uh, Marash. All right, next question. Someone who is not a big fan of beans, what okay. are some alternatives for them? Okay, well, um, in terms of protein rich foods, remember there's also protein in a lot of vegetables. So you can look up, there are a lot of vegetables. Broccoli has a lot of protein, leafy greens. Uh, and again, if we get out of the mindset that like every meal just needs to be focused around protein because it doesn't, um, then you should be okay if you're eating a healthy, nutritious meal. Back to referencing what uh, a lot of the stuff Shelly talks about in her presentation. So if you don't like protein, um, and you're talking about plant sources, um, quinoa, quinoa is like nature's, another one of those like chia seeds I mentioned earlier. Uh, if you like quinoa, try that. If you don't try to like it because it's just darn good. Um, quinoa, brown rice, um, wild rice has a lot of protein. Um, oats, if you like um, oatmeal uh, or overnight oats, I think we're gonna definitely talk about that in a future session. Um, some of the other things I mentioned earlier, hemp seeds, chia seeds, you can get, um, you can get all your protein for the day or most of it in your breakfast if you plan right. So um, of course there's tofu. I know people, so a lot of people don't like tofu. I think it gets a bad rap. I think tofu is great. It's a blank slate. You can make it taste like whatever you like. And there are some tricks on how to deal with it. Um, but that's another good option. Also remember that peanuts, cashews, like good um, nuts have a lot of protein as well, almonds, um, Shelly does remind everybody that, um, you know, you have to be a little mindful because nuts also have a lot of fat. So you don't want to just be taking handfuls and handfuls of peanuts and almonds because then you're taking in a lot of fat. And again, with, uh, with, uh, SCI, we need to be mindful of our, uh, fat intake and obesity, but, um, any whole grains, brown rice, tofu, tempeh, the things I mentioned, lentils, um, chickpeas uh these are all great sources of protein and then there's more we, I, we can we can um oh one more thing i'll add a, a great source of protein a kind of an unsung hero because it's so humble is uh green peas 
just good old green peas. Think about like being a kid and uh, I love green peas. Um, they are packed with protein. A lot of uh, meat substitutes are actually made with uh, peas. Um, they're inexpensive. You keep them in your freezer. You can throw them into your soup. You can throw them into your chili like I made. Um, you can do whatever you want. So um, lots of lots of options. And again, remember a lot of vegetables have protein too. So okay. um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Very good. So we happen to have Shelly Wood with us. Shelly, welcome. And do you have any thing uh, to complement what uh, Arash has been saying. Um, first of all, congrats. I love your new kitchen. It's amazing. Um, I'm going to move. My husband's making dinner right now, so I'm going to go upstairs. Um, all of those are great protein options. Um, every food has protein, but in different, um, in different ratios. So you can get protein in oatmeal too. Um, so all of the, those, and then also my last presentation, I had mentioned um, a lot of different foods and what the protein content was. So I definitely encourage you to look back and watch my last presentation as, as far as um, how much protein you need. I, I addressed all of that in there. So hopefully that helps. Okay, there you go. Um, okay, so question for Arash. Uh, do you steam the tempeh to take out the bitterness? I've seen that oh. recommended and haven't used it yet. That is a great question. Very, whoever that is, that is, uh, you are very astute on that. Um, I only recently learned about that. So here I am cooking for most of my life and I had no idea um, because I would put tempeh into stir fries and sometimes it would get dry or it would get burned. Uh, and then I learned um, your question. So yes, very good point. I do, uh, when I make something like chili, because it's kind of soupy and there's a lot of moisture and liquid, I don't worry about it. But if I want to put tempeh um, in a stir fry or in a stew, or some people like to make like uh, tempeh, slice it up and then roast it in the oven and use it, put it on a sandwich or, you know, whatever. Um, I do recommend um, steaming or boiling it. Um, I kind of take a lazy approach. I just take a pan, put some water in it stick that whole block of tempeh, I have half of it left, but you know, just stick the whole thing right into the pan with boiling water and let it sit for five, eight minutes. And it actually um, soak, absorbs some of that water. So the volume goes up and it becomes a lot more um, uh, pleasurable to, to, to eat, to cut it up and to eat. So I usually do that, drain it and then cut it up. And then you've got some nice big chunks that you can put into whatever. So very good question. And yes, I do recommend if whatever you're cooking it in um, doesn't have a lot of moisture then definitely do that. Um, I do also really like tempeh for like tacos. We use it a lot for like making tacos. Tempeh tacos are great. You can make them taste awesome. Okay. And grilled too is really good. There you go, grilled. Awesome. All right, next question uh, from uh, someone who has a quadriplegia. So any advice on trying not to burn your hands or forearm, forearms in the kitchen or over barbecue that you've used? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we talked about this a little bit in the last um, session. Um, it definitely it depends on your kitchen. You just have to figure out what works. I oftentimes at the beginning would just wear long sleeves as an extra, extra layer of protection. Um, advice on how I think I talked about how uh, at my old apartment, my old kitchen that I just moved from, the knobs for my stove were in the back wall. So I was constantly reaching across. So I have burns all across my forearms from reaching across to reach a knob and then having like steam or something boiling um, just come up and get my arm. Um, so it is a real thing. It is important to be super careful. I would just recommend you, you come up with a plan ahead of time you come up with a safe way to cook. If it means needing assistance to get some things set up, that's fine. Or get your kitchen going. Or if there's one burner on your stove that's closer to you, use that burner. You know, don't don't use the back burners. Uh, try to come up with dishes you can make that can maybe only use one thing. Or if you need to cook separate things, you know, do them on that closer burner so you don't have to reach across. So you can use um, what's the safest setup for you. But um, that's a great question, and it is really important to. Uh, to maintain that safety because yeah, burn, burning yourself can definitely happen. Okay, um, great, thank you. All right, uh, we had uh, one of the participants, uh, she made some recommendation that you could add cashews or macadamia nuts into hummus, um, make chili and then spoon into a cleaned out sugar pie pumpkin 
and bake it in the oven. Oh, there you go. I like that. I like that. So then you can, then what's great about that is then the pumpkin cooks and then you can scoop the pumpkin as you're eating the chili. So that's a, that's a great use of that for all you pumpkin fans out there. Pumpkins and winter squash are in season. <laughs> um, they're, they're great. So that, that's a great idea. Uh, macadamia nuts, I will say a couple things. One, they're very expensive. Um, so watch that. Two, they have a lot, and Shelly can probably speak to this more. I think they have a ton of fat. Um, I do know they have some good nutrients for you too, but I think they are one of the most fatty things, probably one of the fattiest nuts and one of the fattiest things you can eat. So be mindful of that. Um, don't add too many and you might want, you might break the bank if you put too many of them in and you'll go broke eating a lot of macadamia nuts. But Shelly, if you have any feedback on. We're going to do a whole thing on fat. So okay, I'll, be, I'll be talking Perfect. about those. <laughs> Perfect. So stay tuned for that next, for the, whatever session that we talk about that and we'll maybe cover that some more. So. Okay. Uh, next question. Yeah. Uh, next question. How do you eat the hummus uh, just by itself? And is that considered a meal? Um, probably not. Um, but I was making it so you could, that's just an easy thing to have. What the way I made it, that'll keep good in your fridge for probably close to a week. So no, it's not a meal on its own. It could be if you want to just have like um, I would say maybe not just on its own, like, you know, bread and hummus or crackers and hummus. That's not a super nutritious meal. But if uh, you just want to have a simple meal and you don't have a lot of time to cook, you have that in there. You made it a day or two before. Take some of that out. If you have some bread, you have some crackers. If you're gluten free, you get some gluten free bread or crackers or just use vegetables to dip and then make a salad on the side or something else, you, you know, whatever leftovers you have or anything else you want to supplement with. So no, it's probably not a meal on its own, but um, it's just a good thing. And, I'm, and I'm, I can't recommend enough. If you like hummus, um, make it at home and it'll just blow your socks off how much better it is than the store-bought stuff. Light, And you fluffy. can thin it out and put it on a salad too and make it a giant salad. So it can be. It totally thin can. Out. Hummus it's is it's so versatile. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's so versatile. Very good. Okay, next question. Uh, any suggestions uh, for breakfast items that I could uh, sort of get my intake of protein? Yeah, really good question. And I'm going to revert back to something I mentioned at the beginning of this session. I do want to do this maybe in a future session, but um, oats are inexpensive, super healthy. Um, and um, I would say that is one of the best ways you can get a great amount of protein right in your breakfast. Um, and it doesn't have to just be like oatmeal or instant oatmeal. I'm going to show you maybe in a future session how to make overnight oats. And it is the easiest way to make a ton of good, healthy breakfast food, absolutely jam packed with protein because oats themselves have a lot of protein, but I'm going to bring my friend back here, the chia seeds I was talking about at the beginning. This is what I make my, for my daughter. She eats this for breakfast every day. I, uh, when you do it overnight and that's, literally what it means you make it ahead of time so you just put all the stuff into a bowl or into a container or into a jar you let it sit in your fridge overnight and then when you wake up in the morning your breakfast is ready to go no prep needed nothing um and chia seeds have a ton of protein oats have a lot of protein um and then you can you know add something else in if you add um you know plant milk or oat milk or nut milk um, almond milk whatever it is or, or regular milk whatever your preferences are yogurt um, bananas. You, there's just a million ways to go. So I would say for breakfast, that's a really great way to get uh, a lot of healthy protein. Okay. Make chia seeds your friend. You th this stuff is like um, this stuff is like out out of this world. How good and healthy this is. Very good. You can also uh, scramble next... tofu too. Say it again. Scramble tofu, like a yeah, kid friendly with really... tofu. That's a really good one. Yeah, I forgot about that. If you if you like scrambles, if you like like um, you know think of like an egg scramble, but if you're trying not to eat eggs, um, soft tofu is a great substitute. You just stick the whole thing right into the pan. It takes a little bit longer to cook because you're trying to get all that liquid out of it. But any kind of scramble you would make with eggs, make it with soft tofu. Done. Um, easy peasy. Uh, easy tasty meal. Okay. Press Next the water question. out too. Yeah. Thanks. Go ahead. Next question. When you say overnight oats, is that the same thing as steel cut oats? Yeah. So, so oats come in two forms. They come in steel cut where they look like little, um, I, I have them in the fridge, but I'd have to dig them up, but they're just kind of like cut up into little chunks. 
those you have to cook in water, in like boiling water. Um, it doesn't take long. It takes like five or six minutes. But no, I'm not referring to that. I'm talking about rolled oats. So they look like this. And if you think of like good old like old school Quaker oats in the bright, you know, in the navy blue container with the Quaker guy on it, that's rolled oats. That's this. So it comes. It looks. It's flat. So it's been cut. Kind of. They say rolled, but it's been cut in half versus rolled. It's been um, kind of almost put cut up into pieces so these you don't need to cook you just soak them like i said overnight or not even really overnight you can soak them for 20 30 minutes and they're ready to go so um people people underestimate how easy it is to eat oats i didn't even really used to like oatmeal or oats but uh now i do this all the time because you can make it as a snack you can have it for breakfast but you don't have to you can have a couple spoonfuls if you're feeling hungry and you're in between meals and you don't want to eat something unhealthy you know, grab a couple spoonfuls of uh, your overnight oats that you made previously and uh, put that into your put that into your day. And it's just healthy, nutritious and, and tasty. You can make it taste however you want. So I think we'll definitely talk a lot more about that in a future session. I think oats are awesome. Very good. Uh, one last question. Um, kind of a, the tools. Uh, do you ever use mirrors to cook? I probably should, um, especially on the stove. Um, I've just kind of gotten used to being able to basically not see, uh, it helps that I cooked for like 20 years before my injury. So I cook a lot with like feel. Um, so short answer is no, I don't, but I probably could and should. And maybe now that I'm in a, um, in my own home, when I try to put something in, it would be nice to just glance up at the wall and be able to see what I'm cooking. Whereas now I just use sound and, I can see a little bit, but if it's like a big high pot, I'm making something, I usually can't see much of what I'm doing. I just have faith that what I'm doing is right. And I'm stirring and listening and hearing if it's burning or smelling it. And, um, you know, remember cooking is a sensory experience. It's not just like what you're looking at. You want to smell, you want to taste, you want to um, listen. Um, you can learn a lot about what you're making by using all of your senses when you're cooking. So, yeah. Okay, very good. All right, so Shelly, on October 28th, we have carbs, grains, and fibers as part of your session, right? Yeah, let's do that overnight oats for that, maybe, if, if you're Done. interested, Arash. That's oh, perfect. Fine. I'm going to talk a lot about oatmeal, too. <laughs> that's great. So everyone, um, that's October 28th that Shelly is going to be coming back to us uh, uh, on that topic. So uh, again, we'll have the link to register for that event if you wish to uh, participate. So thanks again, Arash, uh, for the wonderful presentation. And thank you, everyone, um, for sticking around. Again, thanks to the folks at the Reef Foundation who gave us a generous grant. Uh, that's what makes these kinds of presentations possible. And again, uh, we'll send you the video uh, recording of, uh, of tonight's presentation on Monday morning uh, for your enjoyment. So thank you again. Thanks, Arash. Have a good night, everyone. And uh, we'll see you next time. Okay. Thank you, bye -bye. everyone. Happy cooking. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.